So my name is Andre Burke, and um, I, uh, I was born at age zero, and uh, have successfully survived as a living organism long enough to become a Forbes contributor and connector in the industry. We'll go ahead from right to left. Wait, one, one second. Uh, before we get started, you guys, we don't have time for lunch today because we've got so much fabulous content. So there are box lunches in the back. Feel free to grab one whenever you're hungry and we'll just keep going. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, this is yeah, operating. Good. Okay, can't hear myself. Uh, my name is Tim Schaefer. I'm a deputy state treasurer. And All right, let's try that again. How's that? How is that? That's better. Okay. My name is Tim Schaefer. I'm a deputy state treasurer in the office of treasurer John Chung. I was the primary staff to the treasurer's 17-member cannabis banking working group, which produced the material that Hezekiah referred to obliquely in the last panel, and I'll have a couple of things to say about that at an appropriate moment. Good morning. No, yep, okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Matt Cuman. I'm an attorney. I've been involved in cannabis since uh, the mid-90s in San Francisco. I have uh, been involved in a lot of fights, including the most recent one, which we'll be discussing today, about uh, how the CHP grabbed uh, my client and took $230,000 and gave it to someone from the Immigration and Citizenship Services. Uh, we'll talk about what that is about. And I'm a, a senior partner in Allen Cuman and Associates, which is a political consulting firm uh, and forecasting firm on cannabis issues. And I'm also uh, uh, the director of a think tank called Cal California Cannabis uh, Educational Voice Foundation, uh, which was responsible for some of the work you saw up in Humboldt County and its passage of its ordinance. And I'm very pleased to be here. And thank you, Susan Soares, for inviting me and for ha doing such a wonderful job on this event. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Matt Young. I'm with APOP Media. We put TVs and iPads in dispensaries all over California. Uh, once again, thank you, Susan, wherever she went. This is beautiful. Glad to be here. Um, I also am on the board of directors of Glocka, which is the Greater Los Angeles Collective Association, which represents about 35 of the legal dispensaries in Los Angeles, as well as the UCBA and the SCC. Hi, my name is Bo Whitney. I'm vice president and senior economist for New Frontier Data. Uh, New Frontier Data is the global leader in big data analytics, specifically focused in the cannabis space. Um, we've been referenced in 68 countries, 5 billion page views, um, and our goal is to provide data that's well-vetted, actionable, um, non-partisan, non-advocacy for policymakers, operators, and investors. Hello, everyone. My name is Fran Turner. I'm the senior managing partner of Seven Pass Global. We are a hybrid hedge fund and private equity fund focused particularly in the non-plant touching, but additionally we do investments on the plant side. Our first fund is actually a dual fund. Second fund is non-plant touching, and we're also launching the world's first security token that's focused on a tokenized fund. I'd uh, like to mention before we get started, we originally had two women uh, prepared for this panel. They were unfortunately unable to make it, but I know that's important in this industry. And so we'll have a, an all-male panel this time. So last month, I, uh, and part of the reason I was selected for this panel is I, I sent a social media post and I was asking to speak uh, relating to an article about with companies who were thriving under the medical marijuana model and who are now struggling under legalization. I posted it to Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and I received 50 responses within the day, 45 Facebook shares, and it was to the point where I had to set up a Google form 
and a survey to collect all the information. One of the things we'll be doing here today is I'll be sharing some of those stories as we get into each topic. One of the replies I got was, it shouldn't have to be a fight to stay out of jail and keep my own property and business, but that's how it is now. I guess as a second time offender, within the span of two years after legalization, I'm looking at one year in jail and I need to forfeit my business and my property. So at the same time, I'm getting it on my email and I'm listening on the radio and uh, there's a commercial selling register, they say, for our online course. Find out everything you need to know to make money in the cannabis industry. Now, I'm not going to identify who actually put out that commercial, but they're on this boat uh, and they're on the next floor. So that's the dichotomy we have with what the promises are around this industry and what the reality is. I'd like to begin with Matt Young of APOP. Is the California cannabis industry really a get-rich scheme anymore? Uh, unfortunately not. I'm in the position to where I talk to dispensaries every day, brands every day, ancillary businesses every day, and unfortunately, it gets harder and harder to even survive, let alone make money. Um, Raising capital is, is one issue, but on top of that, with the dispensaries, is that, is that better? Okay, sorry guys. On the dispensary side, the regulations, on the distribution side, there's testing issues, packaging issues. On, if you're a cultivator, a manufacturer, you're moving into new buildings, you're buying new equipment, you're moving into new cities, because unfortunately, a lot of the cities where they were located before, they are not issuing any licenses and they're having to upend their whole business. And even companies that are 10 years old that are very well established large companies are you know, experiencing growing pains to where they're a 10 year old startup. And no one is getting rich right now, but that's okay. You know, the, the cream will rise to the top and everyone buckles down and works hard. and. You know, this is just the very beginning of a very long journey. I think if I can add to that, if we look at just American statistics in general, so 80% of companies survive their first year, 50% of companies are a business within five years, and if you apply that to actually regulated businesses, it's more 20% actually survive. So again, it's lack of capital collectively, and obviously this is intensified by limited bank lending, again, a scarce uh, both venture, private equity market exists today, but also just operations in regards to regulated businesses. So on top of that, if we talk about California specifically, because of legislation moving a tab more slowly, what's happening is that other uh, companies from other states or other countries are also moving in, and they are also well capitalized. So therefore, they're actually cannibalizing some of the existing market. So again, it's an evolution, it's a large market, but it's definitely a longer play than a shorter play. But the 80-20 rule will still be applicable. Okay. Um, one comment um, from me about all this Oops. is that most folks who are in what they call the legacy market, I guess it's been referred to, uh, haven't really, and even the large capital coming in, don't understand the market trends and how everything's moving towards biomass and the incredible amount of fragmentation and slices of the market, whether it's distilling, uh, winterizing, all of the, you know, extraction, um, all designed to address this massive increase in extracted products is what I call it. Someone may have a different nomenclature. So what I think, and I've seen this even with, you know, wealthy capital folks coming in, and even with my cannabis guys, you know, Hezekiah and I went, you know, go back to the Humboldt growers. They don't really understand that, the, and I haven't caught up yet to that real reality of where the market's going. And the individuals, you know, I can segment out just in the extraction industry, probably seven or eight different sub-markets, and people aren't seeing that yet. And I think that's going to make a huge difference in the statistic, which I agree with, that it's you know, something like 
two thirds or three quarters of folks are, are going to go out of business, even if they had been in business before. So in, in North America, between the 2015 and 2017, roughly $6 billion was invested in the cannabis um, uh, area. Um, a lot of the money that I see being made is not necessarily in the plant touching sphere, it's the picks and shovel guys. And so the greenhouse providers, the soil, the nutrients, those folks that don't necessarily depend upon the plant touching side of the, of the industry and aren't subject to 280E taxation, et cetera. Um, and depending upon the risk profiles of the investors, um, there's, there's been a large amount of inflows on cultivation and retail, but there's also been a lot of inflows on real estate and software. And so depending upon where the investors' minds are at, the risk tolerance, they're gonna either go with the plant touching and go all in, or they're gonna invest in the ancillary businesses. Great, so uh, keeping in with the last panel and the conversation we didn't really complete is one on banking, and that's, that's why it's a pleasure here to have Tim Schaefer with us, the California Deputy Treasurer of Public Finance. I wanna share with everyone what one company wrote me. So the, this is Bloombox, and uh, these, these folks provide B2B software uh, as product, as a service, and they said legalization didn't help us with investment capital because there's no way to safely bank or insure these investment funds. Smaller investors cannot incur risk, and larger V-type, VC-type investors are still bound by so-called vice clauses, commonly embedded in their partnership agreements, that prohibit even indirect investments in federally scheduled substances. Is this really and strictly a Schedule One issue? A complex question with an equally complex answer. Let me start. <clears throat> let me start. Uh, start here. Uh, banking. Banking. Many businesses is a question of a banker being able to engage in reasonable risk management. Let me give you an example that has nothing to do with cannabis. Um, many banks will refuse to open accounts for check cashing services, for horse racing tracks, for payday auto lenders, uh, for card rooms. Why? Um, because often these organizations can mask um, occult activities which will create regulatory risk for the bank, so they avoid it. Now, notice that it's perfectly legal to be in the card room business or to run a horse racing track, assuming you've got licenses from your locality to do that. Introduce the notion of cannabis, a federally scheduled drug, and then the problem begins to metastasize. The problem metastasizes in this way, in my view, um, bankers are risk averse. And if this is a risk management business, the default position can easily become risk avoidance rather than risk management if there's no clear pathway to economics that would work. That introduces the next facet of the risk. And that is because there is this growing wave in our nation to discuss cannabis. The fact that it may be descheduled scares the banks. Why? Well, because they can set up an apparatus that will require um, a great deal of investment only to look up and discover that we're now off schedule one and we're back in the same category as a card room or a racetrack and so forth. And therein is, I think, one of the Rubik's Cubes that need to be solved. One of the things that I would encourage you all to become familiar with, Hezekiah mentioned this in the last panel, is this document right here. I'm not gonna read it to you. It's available on the state treasurer's website. The title of it is Banking Access Strategies for Cannabis-Related Businesses. 
I can give you just a few seconds of what the four primary recommendations are. First, <clears throat> at least for the here and now, develop a system that will accommodate the cash industry rather than trying to force it into the business, figure out a way to accommodate the cash industry a little bit better than we're doing. We call that uh, inside the office the armored car bus route strategy. Number 38 bus run by Brinks that makes a scheduled stop everywhere and picks up currency to pay uh, taxes and fees to the state and to the local agencies. Number two, um, develop a data portal. Those of you who are familiar with the Washington system uh, know that the um, uh, cannabis control mechanism in that state are, 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 are figuratively speaking kind of bolted on the framework that was used for liquor control. Uh, number three, uh, investigate uh, the feasibility of establishing a state-backed financial institution that would cater to or accommodate um, the industry. I hope I get questions on that later. And then finally, and this to me is the big one, develop a consortium of bankers, regulators, cannabis industry folks, um, the stakeholders that were discussed in the last panel that are medical customers. Um, uh, put them together in um, a group that will uh, devote some energy and time to lobbying federal legislators and federal regulators about the evolving nature of it. Those are the four things you'll see in the report and we're underway with each of those four now. And I agree with Tim. I think if, if I can add a little bit of perspective from the bank side, up until about a year and a half ago, I ran uh, America's fastest growing bank for a period of three years. We grew from not 1.9 billion to over 13 billion that period of time. Aggregating deposits is the most difficult thing that's possible. If you take a look at it, you've got to, if you have a perspective, A, Asking for deposits or giving a loan? Obviously asking for deposits is more challenging. So we had to take higher risk strategies that involved EB-5, broker dealer, uh, cash businesses. The, the regulators are spent approximately half of the year, so about 150 business days in our offices. And again, measuring and analyzing our higher risk businesses. Banks themselves can hold 25%, typically if it's well run, of their collective deposit base in high risk. And what that means is it's a fight for what high-risk deposits can actually sit on that balance sheet. So with that comes the inherent risk that Tim mentioned. So, and again, if you take a look at the smaller banks that are participating, there are about 300 banks across the U.S. right now that actually actively engage in cannabis business. To actually have a KYC and AML program and BSA program that facilitates it actually costs tens of thousands of dollars, if not hundreds. And on top of that, if you look at these smaller banks, they don't have the technology and some of the core processing solutions to actually interpret and understand exactly where that money is coming from. So that entire process on an ongoing basis ends up costing hundreds of thousands of dollars because you need personnel and staff to actually manage that as well. So that's the main challenge that they're having. And to Tim's point, it is very challenging and the natural mentality of the banker can be risk averse. The other side of the challenge is the actual payment side. So if we think about Visa, MasterCard, um, a bin basically is where all the transactions pass through. If you think of every hundred dollars that passes through a, a bin, only one dollar can actually be high risk related. And so by definition, cannabis is high risk. So we also need to come up with additional payment mechanisms that'll help evolve the industry so it's not only just a cash business. Go ahead. Lately, lately I've been saying that we're, we have two policies at play. One is to allow cannabis and the other is prohibit it. And the, uh, it's impossible to move forward unless one is gonna win. And so we're back to, you have to organize. You have to go to the legislature. The courts aren't gonna help. You have to actually uh, force this issue and the absurdity of the contradictions uh, between what is really happening and what the population in this country wants. And ultimately Congress has to do something about it. That's my perspective. I've gone back and forth with Fiona Ma and other folks in the state government about a bank. And while it's a really wonderful idea and I support it, um, there's just too many, I think, too many barriers because of federal prohibition to allow it. So un until we get Congress to do something, and this is just an old song, I feel 
kind of stupid keep bringing it up, but until we you know, get our Congress people to actually do something about it and organize effectively uh, rather than the old left-wing firing squad, you know that joke, how does a left-wing firing squad line up in a circle? And so you know, everyone's gonna have to learn how to organize and work together put the egos aside, and then we gotta go to Congress, because that's where, ultimately, I think this has to get fixed. From personal experience, our companies, we've lost two bank accounts just this month. Uh, one of the reasons was we deposited more than $5,000 per month into the account, which, as a business owner, having $5,000 deposited in cash is not a lot of money, especially in a cash business. And the other was because, even though we're a non-plant-touching business, we accept money from plant touching businesses and that account was subsequently shut down. And right now I'm gonna have to talk to, and find one of those 300 banks because I have tried to open new bank accounts and we have to put our website down. Our website mentions cannabis and we have been unable so far, we've only tried this week, but we've been unable to open a new bank account, which is very discouraging, especially for someone who has to run a business. So we'll see you know, what changes we can manage. I'm gonna have to read that report too, but uh, hopefully these rules can change quickly because it's, it's, that's one more deterrent to running a cannabis business on top of all of everything else. Banking is, is also a huge challenge. So the, uh, I, I don't know if the banks, and I hate to put a wet blanket over everybody, but um, I don't think the banks have an incentive in order to enter into this space Okay, so sorry about that. I don't think the banks have an incentive to enter into this space because they, the, the way that they grow their revenue is through acquisitions of other banks. And so they don't wanna jeopardize those acquisitions by entering into the cannabis space, so they're deferring and, and staying away from that. Um, and uh, um, now I'm from Portland, Oregon. So in Oregon, we have uh, two main credit unions um, that provide banking services, checking and savings, $500 a month for a checking and savings account. Um, and that's to cover the costs. Um, but they only have 600 accounts total, and there's over 4,400 businesses in Oregon right now that are cannabis related. So that's the, that kind of draws the picture of, or paints the picture of just the extent of how little banking is offered to the cannabis industry right now. Good. Uh, Bo, don't go anywhere. I have the next one for you. Let's talk about taxes and costs. So one of the replies that was shared with me, um, this fellow says, I was on the board of Silicon Valley Americans for safe access. San Jose imposed a tax, which was a point of contention. But the real bad part was not just a tax, it was no licenses for years. And then an, act an actual crackdown and monopoly on 16 businesses, just like BCC is doing now. How have they evolved, and how has that monopoly come about? Well, the, w the way that I look at, at taxation is, is that taxation really influences the amount of legal participation in the system. And if taxes are too high, then it dissuades people from participating, either from um, an operator's perspective or a consumer's perspective. And um, for example, and I think in Nevada City, they had a $10 a square foot tax on their operations. So if you're a 20,000, regardless of if it's canopy or whatever. So in that sense, if you're a 20,000 square foot operation, already you're paying $200,000 in taxes just at the local level before you generate any revenue, <laughs> before any. And so that's just, it's, Basically, and there was a phrase that um, I heard here in California, it's called uh, prohibition through legalization. And so, and I, that really resonated with me because um, they say, hey, yeah, come on in. We want your tax money. We're gonna tax you until you can't operate. And then what good is it, right? So, um, but consumers and uh, businesses are extremely uh, price sensitive. And um, we've, at New Frontier Data, we've developed models that show just how price sensitive consumers are and what level of legal participation would occur at various tax levels. 
Um, we provided testimony at the state legislature in Sacramento on a tax reduction bill that looked at a reduction from 15% to 11%, so fairly nominal reduction, but it was going to generate $168 million in additional retail sales, 64,000 um, new entrants, uh, consumers from the illicit market into the legal market, and unfortunately, um, that proposal was voted down. So, um, not sure what solution I can provide, but it's very, very compelling that as um, consumers are price sensitive, um, policymakers need to um, adjust and develop their tax policies accordingly. You know, I mean, that's a really good point. And, and I think it goes back to what I always see is that there are contradictory policies at play. And if the government does not want consumption, for example, Mark Kleiman and some other prominent policy makers are basically, you know, like in Oregon, how they wanted to limit, you know, the, uh, the amount grown and so forth. They don't want it, so they put a sin tax on it, and that's really what we're seeing. We're seeing um, the government contradicting itself with saying we want legalization, but we really don't. And I think until that is addressed, and until there's really policy goals that are clarified, uh, you're going to see this. Um, I had a conversation with Lori Ajax a few months ago, and I asked her, you know, where, who's on your staff doing policy? Like the Board of Equalization, for example, has policy people. Um, and she said, well, we do policy ourselves. We don't have a professional policymaker. And so to me, that was a, a red flag that, that we're not really thinking about policy. We're really you know, sweeping it under the carpet, but everything's driven by policy. Everything. And so unless you have that resolved, which it's not, it's a contradiction, then we're going to be in this mess. So another side of the tax issue is leveling the playing field, where legal license businesses are forced to pay all these licensing fees, all of these taxes, and you have the, the gray and the black market that aren't contributing anything to the taxes, which is you know, another struggle to keep your legal business alive. And that's where enforcement really has to come into play to hopefully shut down the illegal operations so it's easier for those licensed businesses to stay open and have a level playing field. Because right now it's, it's really unfair and hard for the dispensaries and hard for the licensed brands to be able to compete with companies that aren't paying payroll taxes. You know, it, it's 40% it, of your business, plus you've got 280E, which no one's brought up yet which is totally unfair, which the governor just rejected that bill. So there's a lot of things we've got to work on. If I may, um, uh, th some of you know me, you've heard me speak before. I'm by no means an apologist for banks, but the, the banter you just heard is really critical to the banking discussion as well. Bankers are creatures of analysis without clear sight lines into financial data, they don't get comfortable with risk. One of the principal sight lines into financial data for small businesses are tax returns. 280E essentially shoves deductible expenses into the background for federal purposes, making it more difficult for the banker to assess his or her risk. Uh, that r remains a problem that I think it's, it, it's, to this observer is a bit nonsensical if what you're trying to do is to achieve tax compliance. That's the second thing, the second thing is that remember that to a bank, and again, no, no, I'm not an apologist for banks here, I'm just trying to keep myself centered on this, to a bank taking a deposit. That deposit is your asset. It is the bank's liability. The bank's liability has to be offset with an asset that will earn more than what the deposit is costing it. If we insist on this bizarre um, mechanism of um, uh, forfeiture, of asset forfeiture on federally insured institutions, 
what have you forced the bank to do? You forced the bank to take deposits from the industry but not lend to the industry. Not lending to the industry is a lower yield uh, prospect. So you've now put the squeeze on the bank. Again, I'm not an apologist here. I'm just trying to report the balls and strikes, okay? You've put the squeeze on the bank at the very same time that some of our tax policies have put the squeeze on the industry that's struggling how to get to the fin struggling to get to the finish line. Thanks. Just to size the extent of 280E, New Frontier uh, data presented um, in the White House uh, an analysis of the 280E, um, looking at the entire U.S. market over a seven-year period. Cannabis businesses pay approximately $14.6 billion in additional taxes than they would normally pay if they were treated as a normal business. The health policy advisor for President Trump said, why would I give up $14.6 billion in revenue? And um, the response to that, of course, is, well, look at all those jobs. Look at all the conversion from the illicit market. Look at all of the social issues that you address by through this legalization. And so there's obviously a net benefit to you know, the 280 tax reform, um, but it's gonna take a lot of education and, and a lot of additional data um, in order for them to be convinced of this. Just a quick point. Um, if I start talking about 280 I'll go crazy because I was the architect and the first guy who put the legal team together to litigate the CHAMP case in the U.S. tax court. So uh, that's a whole other issue that's going, hasn't even begun to rear its ugly head yet. Um, but what I wanted to say was that I'm talking to people and, and seeing some stirrings of trying to get local cities or counties to actually have citizens advocate to have no taxes in those cities or counties. And I think that's gonna catch on if everyone can start to talk in their communities about not imposing taxes, because you've already got the retail sales tax in California anywhere from seven and a half to nine and a half percent, plus the 15% state excise tax, that's 22 to 25% right there. So you don't need any more taxes at the local level, and you can always impose them later if things start crack cranking up. So I think from an organizing point of view, and that's often how I look at this as a political organizing matter, I think you have to go to your small, uh, the city councils and the county boards of supervisors and say, look, and, and you'd be surprised how many people don't go to these meetings or don't meet with legislators. But if you go and say, look, you're gonna kill this industry and you're gonna thwart your goal of ending the black market, so why don't you look at the data, the kind of data that you're, you're talking about. So I would encourage everyone to think about finding a community maybe like Berkeley, like Dale, Dale's Berkeley, that's actually did just reduce their taxes from, was it 10 to 5% or something like that? Yeah. So, and. And, and continue to, to sort of push on that issue. So that would be my, my two cents on that. Okay. Moving, on. Moving on to licensing. So here was a comment that came to me. I started down a path to getting a distributor license in San Francisco. And I found insurmountable obstacles at every turn. When I was unable to find a location suitable and the minute areas available within San Francisco where my activity was zoned correctly, the city asked me nicely to shut my business down. I did. It was hard. I let my five employees go, and I cried a bunch. Eight of ten brands I was representing last year no longer exist in the legal market. The people behind those brands are like family to me and they lost their livelihoods over these new laws. How far off course have we become? Well, I think we're seeing it in some of our portfolio activity. Um, it almost becomes a competitive advantage to actually have teams that specialize in getting licenses. So you're basically putting together consultants, bankers, professionals that specialize in those various licenses. So it's almost an unfair competitive advantage in regards to how we're going about it. And then it goes back to what I originally mentioned. What we're doing is leveraging companies from other states, other countries, to actually 
uh, import their business into the state. They've got proven business models, which is part of the credibility that you need, and then they have the existing capital. So unfortunately, the lack of speed at this moment or the tardiness in some of this licensing negatively affects the California business specifically, but creates advantages for some of the outstate competition. And the other part here is we're, we, we're going after multiple international licenses, and what we are seeing is it is an educational process, but the period appears to be somewhat shorter than what we're seeing in, in California at this point in time. So from a policy perspective, it's really difficult to balance the market versus the free market. Um, in Oregon, for example, um, there's one cultivation license for every $500,000 of the total addressable market, the total revenue in the entire market. Whereas in Florida, that in an area where they have limited licensure, that's one license for every $125 million. And so the concept here is it, it's difficult for policymakers to balance what's the sweet spot. Um, there's data out there. Um, they just haven't asked for it. They haven't, it hasn't resonated with them. Um, because, you know, in such states as Oregon or Washington, you have super saturation of supply. You have declining values. Um, declining revenues, and then people go out of business. And compounded with 280E, compounded with the lack of banking, then um, that's a tough nut to crack because, um, you know, people are, are, that's real wealth that, because friends and families are the people that need to invest in this. So if you don't set it up correctly, then you have a chance to wipe out individuals' wealth, you know, to a, it, to a massive extent. So that, that's the tough nut to crack right now, and nobody's really dialed it in quite yet. So that's another thing to talk about, is wiping out your wealth, which I've experienced a couple times in my cannabis career. And that's why I had to start APOP and not touch this plant anymore. Um, but starting over at zero is tough. And when you look at like the social equity programs that they're trying to start, this business takes millions of dollars to do. If you don't have millions of dollars, you've got to team up with people that have millions of dollars. And there's companies I've talked to on the social equity side, and it seems like they're kind of taking advantage. You know, these people have already been beat down. They've already lost everything. And now companies are going to use their, you know, experience and, and their arrest and their financial ruin for their own personal gain. So that's another thing that this, the licensing, it's just another deterrent for you know, the regular guy, everyone wants to be a part of this industry. And that regular person who has all this experience, who loves the plant, loves the industry, you know, he's got an uphill battle to, to try and really participate and, and succeed. So hopefully, you know, events like this can get people educated, get people to meet other people, you know, that can help them raising capital, help them get licensed, all those kind of things. And, and you know, hopefully it grows from there. You know, this industry in essence is nine, year, nine months old. So uh, we're at the start of something great and hopefully it, it gets better and better. So in nascent markets like this, it's natural to have a lot of actors come in at the beginning, everybody's excited. Um, there is a passion, but just naturally these markets consolidate. And so my advice to you as small businesses, now policymakers want to protect small business while also allowing for growth and development and consolidation in the market. But um, my advice to, to um, operators here is um, be sure to do your due diligence. Um, be sure to have an exit strategy. Um, talk to people. And if you want to compete with the big guys, then develop some type of consortiums or business um, you know, affiliations or groups, um, um, collaborations with others so that you can compete or um, realize just where your cost structure is and, um, and plan accordingly so that you develop and carve out your own niche. Because um, if you don't, you'll just be consumed and wiped out just like um, a lot of the small um, businesses out there right now. Don't get me started. <laughs> um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm going to whine for one second that both the industry and the government and the consumers are um, not doing enough to make the changes that need to happen because everybody's retreating to their corner and trying to scrap it out themselves. And so unless, you know, what did uh, Franklin say? You know, if we don't all hang together, we're going to hang separately. And I, I can't keep emphasizing that enough. And that actually means that you have to talk to people and communicate and organize because otherwise you're just going to back back right into this legal concept that I keep explaining to everybody called clusterfuck. And that's, uh, that's essentially what, what's going to keep happening unless you guys do something about it. There's leadership in this movement. Uh, I like to refer to myself as a general of the rebel forces and the war on drugs. Uh, but it's, you need a lot more. You need the people to actually stand up. You've got to do more. And that's always going to be my message. I'm not going to be an apologist for the banks. I keep repeating that <laughs> because I'm really not. Many of our small banks, let's, let's focus on some numbers because I think what Matt has just described is a sliver in the door that you can stick your foot in. As we sit here today, there are roughly 165 banks in California. Uh, that's down from about 225 just nine years ago. Consolidation is an inevitable part of the banking business as well. So let's think about how little banks start. Little banks start with an entrepreneurial instinct. And I'll bet that sounds familiar to most of you. That entrepreneurial instinct brings together local business people who say, hey, I've got a great idea. Why don't we start a bank? Then their journey begins also, where they are subject to regulation. This is not a request for your sympathy. Instead, I'm asking for empathy. If we understand where the other folks are coming from, it makes our problem easier to solve because we can, we can engage in more productive dialogue. So the small business people come together and they form a bank. And what's the first thing the regulator says to them? You can't grow too fast. You can't make certain kinds of loans. You can't engage in certain types of business. That regulator keeps that group of business people on a very short leash until it can be satisfied that that new little bank doesn't represent a contagion point for the larger banking system. If, in fact, a regulator shows up, says, ah, 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 it looks to me like you may be banking a marijuana business, who are the people who are directly impacted by that? The original shareholders. Guess who the directors of that little bank are? The original shareholders. So you can see how the problem becomes cyclical. Here's what I would offer up for your, just to ponder. When we conducted one of our public hearings up in Santa Rosa, I heard from a very passionate member of the industry, the cannabis industry, say, I can't even go into my local community bank and sit with a senior executive of the local community bank and have a conversation about my business. Class, what's wrong with that picture, okay? That entrepreneur wasn't asking for a loan, wasn't asking for a deposit relationship. That entrepreneur was asking for the expertise of that local banker. So I've had the same conversation that I've just had with you with local bankers, okay? Because if we stop retreating to our corners, as Matt has described, and understand that small business flourishes in the banking sector the same way small business will flourish in your sector, and it's only by talking to one another effectively that we're going to make some progress. Tim, would you like to explain the set of visual aids you've brought here? I'm sure others are curious. Uh, I'd be happy to. to. I, I flashed this one around. This is available on the state treasurer's website. I would encourage you to review it. Uh, I will tell you, having worked for John Chung um, as his employee for the last five plus five years, and as his consultant for seven years before that, this is not somebody who writes reports and files them away. This is our blueprint. I brought a fresh copy, the one on my desk. I 
promise you is dog-eared and it's got lots of little yellow stickies on it. This is an important road map for the hard work that will have to be done. I'm not gonna make any apologies. It is hard work. Sure. The second thing that you, uh, boy, that didn't last, that one went fast, didn't it? The second thing I would want to encourage you all to uh, pay attention to is there are a number of jurisdictions in the United States that have examined the feasibility of creating a public bank. Now uh, that, for the moment, that has nothing to do with your business, but stay with me for a few seconds and I'll bring them together. This is, has been resurrected as a result of the Occupy uh, movement after the financial crisis in 2008-2009. Uh, people in small businesses and, and, and um, many communities in California felt that big Wall Street had abandoned them. And so the call went out to have the state, or in some cases, a locality, get into the business of owning a bank. The model typically held up as a paragon of success is the Bank of North Dakota. I might add, which is owned by the state of North Dakota. I might add, to temper your enthusiasm, the Bank of North Dakota is the only publicly owned bank in the United States, and it was formed 99 years ago. Okay. So that's not to say you should be discouraged. Now, inevitably, inevitably, after we legalized cannabis two and a half years ago, uh, two years ago, um, the... Um, the public bank movement merged for a little while with the cannabis banking group. That just made things worse in some jurisdictions. But that doesn't mean it's going to be worse forever. So if you are from various parts of the state, Santa Rosa, or you are in Richmond, uh, Berkeley, um, Albany, Oakland, and Alameda County, uh, each of those areas is looking into this public bank uh, um, idea. Uh, the city and county of San Francisco is looking on it. I, I serve as the treasurer's delegate to the task force, to the San Francisco supervisors on this. The state itself is looking into it, although ours, here's the merger, ours is focused on standing up a bank that would engage in the cannabis business. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean a bank the way you and I know a bank. It may be a payment system, it may be a credit union, uh, it's, still, uh, it's still being uh, studied. SB 930, authored by Senator Hertzberg, uh, at the request of candidate uh, for treasurer Fiona Ma, full disclosure, I'm not campaigning here, um, was introduced into the Senate last year, was passed out of the Senate by uh, not, a major, not a, uh, unanimously, but very close, um, and uh, got to the second house and uh, died in its appropriations committee. I expect that we will see that back again. The difference is that we will have completed the study that's recommended in here about uh, how to do that that may inform the legislature in the next legislative session beginning in January. One quick, just quick. With all the respect. With all due respect to my esteemed colleague, the private banks in the state will allow a public bank over their dead banking bodies. Okay? That's my perspective on it. Thank you all for a great panel. I have a fun tax question, if that can even happen, but um, so, Matt Cuman, you represent a new client that was a, a licensed transporter that uh, had $230,000 seized by the Department of Homeland Security. This is the first seized by the CHP, by the CHP and, turned and turned over to the Department of Homeland Security. Um, since this technically is the first shot across the bow against the licensed industry by the federal government, I am curious, uh, does that licensed operator owe taxes on that money, or are we going to wait until a settlement is reached before that's determined? Hell if I know. <laughs> you know, uh, first of all, that, sh should I take two minutes to tell the story, or yes. do you want to hear about yeah, what's absolutely. going on? Yes. Uh, 
this, this is a, a, a great case that we're going to use to smash open the contradictions. So keep following it, support us. Uh, the CHP did stop my clients first for a mud flap violation on their pickup truck, then let them go, and then they followed them up the road, uh, stopped them again because it turned out that uh, the CHP had it in for my clients who had both been in the CHP and had left the CHP. One of the clients had uh, been fired from the CHP. He got reinstated and then he resigned. The other one was accused of stealing from a locker room at the CHP. He was actually charged criminally and the jury did not find him guilty and he is therefore innocent. But the CHP terminated him for insubordination because he wouldn't tell them what happened upon his advice of his lawyer during that criminal proceeding. So he was fired for insubordination. Those are my guys, so when you hear all the press stuff about how dirty my guys are, just remember that these were guys who were just doing their job and neither of them, you know, were, I mean, there was a real story behind who they were. Uh, what happened was once they were stopped on the second stop, they were treated uh, like animals by the CHP officers. They were uh, taken to the Merced CHP station. Uh, the CHP called the Fresno Office of the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, had an officer from that office in Fresno come up to Merced and take the $230,000 into custody. This was a clear workaround to the Rohrbacher Blumenauer Amendment, for those of you who don't know, federal law that prohibits the Department of Justice from spending money on cannabis interdiction in medical cannabis states. The, Dep the Department of Homeland Security has a separate budget. So isn't that tricky? The federal government has shown us what they're doing. Now, when the uh, when we challenge, and I just uh, will be filing forfeiture, administrative claims, and so forth, and we're going to be challenging that in federal court in the Eastern District, when the Eastern District forfeiture attorney for the United States attorney walks into the courtroom, guess what I'm going to tell the judge? He can't be here because your budget, his budget doesn't allow him to be here. So I've spoken to a couple of other attorneys, notably Eric Shevin. I haven't gotten a lot of details from him, but we know this is a trend. They're going to take the money and give it to DHS as a workaround around Rohrbacher Blumenauer. That should really, really make everybody stand up and shout, and I hope everybody will do that. And that's the basic story. We're going to be filing all sorts of actions. I'm already talking to you know clients around the state. We're going to Mark Wasserman and his brother, Craig, where are you guys? Raise your hands, my co-counsel. Co We're going to be creating a huge stir about this. We're going to be getting attorneys. I want to get an attorney from every county in the state to be on the pleadings. We're going to get a class action injunction against the CHP. And then, oh yeah. And then when, we're, then when this thing is revealed for its absurdity, then the legislature will hopefully fix this because this is all about a legislative fix. The courts are going to just follow the law, call balls and strikes, uh, you know, and so forth. They're not going to give us anything. They really haven't, and they, they don't plan on it. That's not where you go. It's in the legislative arena. So that's what's going to happen. Keep, po keep wallet follow us. There's going to be lots of stories about this. Don't believe a goddamn word the CHP is saying. Yeah. Hi, my name is Etienne Fontan. I'm with Berkeley Patients Group. Uh, we turn 19 next month. We've unfortunately been kicked out of over 30 different banks. And we've heard this discussion of banks coming along and it's actually going to happen. Is it going to unfortunately take a worst case scenario where a distributor or owner is murdered before there is actual action taken place at the state slash federal level? I would hate to think that, but unfortunately, these are the realities we face every day when we're having to move large sums of cash. Bo. You know, uh, and congratulations. I mean, Berkeley Patients Group has been a, a stalwart member of the community and, and particularly of the reform community. And my hat's off to you. Um, I had a client that was bringing cannabis to a, a, a cannabis retail operation. Was, uh, there was someone, a, a criminal was staking out the operation, followed him, and then beat the crap out of him. So it's lucky that he wasn't murdered. But I think these sorts of things are going on, but people are afraid to report them. And so that's part of why we don't get more action, because people don't realize the severity of the problem. Okay. Bo, did you have 
you have something you want to say about this? So uh, prior to joining New Frontier Data, I was the chief operations officer at Golden Leaf Holdings um, in Oregon. Um, some of my coworkers didn't show up one day because um, their best friend was murdered. Um, he had his head blown off for $40,000. And so to me, on a personal basis, um, I don't, people are already being murdered for, <laughs> and so it's, and I agree with you, people don't necessarily talk about it. Um, so I don't know if that's going to be what puts the whole banking issue over the top. It's going to be something else, probably just the scale on economics rather than the humanity. Hello, uh, I'm Dale Geringer. I, I represent California Normal, National Organization for Reform and Marijuana Laws. Uh, we are uh, a nonprofit, a 501c4. I've uh, never been in the business, of course, at all. Uh, I'm also uh, probably the oldest marijuana organization in the state, going back. And we've had a bank account with no problems, I must say, since 1974. Uh, but uh, we started. We did encounter a glitch about 10 years ago when we started listing dispensaries, and we tried to get a PayPal account so people could pay dispensaries who want, or collectives, actually they were patient collectives who wanted to get listed online, could pay by PayPal. And PayPal said, hey, we're terminating your account because you're dealing with these things that are federally illegal. So we said, oh, well, you know, you do have a point there, they are illegal, we'll stop doing business with those people. Uh, but we continued to list doctors. Now, doctors are legal, and there's a federal court decision even saying so. They got wind of that, and they terminated our services altogether. Then, more recently, uh, we've started to hear a spate of nonprofits, like other normal chapters, like Doctors' organizations like the Alameda County Democrats, uh, Brownie Mary Democrats, who have not been able to get banking services. 50, again, all nonprofits. This is new. Is there something happening there amongst the regulators in Washington? Is there some new rule or something? Why has this started to happen after all of these years? If I may insert myself again. Uh, Dale, I think this working committee out of uh, the, the prohibitionists in the White House and the Office of National Drug Control Policy have a multifaceted, targeted campaign going on right now. One is the transferring assets to DHS uh, or other agencies that can take the asset. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's obviously a stupid play because we're going to beat them in federal court when the U.S. attorneys come in. But there's, that's a part of it as well. I think you also you see this massive uh, tax auditing that's going on in Colorado. If you haven't, you know, wait, you know, with all the problems we have here in California, wait till the IRS starts auditing your businesses. They're just going to get the licenses from the state, and they're going to start auditing at a much higher rate than they do for small businesses generally, like we see. Like we see, and my colleague Rachel Gillette, some of you may know her in Colorado. I talk to her frequently about this. There's multi, multiple strategies that they're engaging in to continue to attack us and continue to try to cripple this industry. And those people are not going to stop unless we, you know, unless we shout and scream, basically. Okay, we have time for one more. Um, following up on SB 930, <clears throat> the review that I did on that bill, uh, it seemed that the focus, the scope of 930 was becoming more and more narrow only for direct services provided to these businesses. As we know, businesses have lots of related uh, services. Is it going to get expanded? Is it going to remain so small? And it has no support from uh, banking uh, community as far as I knew. Um, I will give you an opinion. This is not a policy of the state treasurer. It is an opinion from his policy advisor. So just to be clear on that, because there's media in the room, he has not taken a position on SB 930 or did not take a position. 
Uh, it was my view, which I expressed to the author and to the sponsor, that the bill had some infirmities, uh, simply because of the economics of the banking business and the manner in which new banks are set up. Now, having said that, uh, I was reminded of a story that I was told by former State Senator Art Torres, who back in the, I'm thinking now, middle 1980s, some of you are old enough to remember PSA Airlines and Air Cal. And um, gasoline prices went up, and airfares from Southern California went up with them, and Senator Torres, in a politically brilliant move, said, I've got a great idea. We can get these guys to the table if I introduce a bill suggesting that we have a state airline. And suddenly, everybody from the airline started to show up in Sacramento to discuss fair regulation. And it was my view to Senator Hertzberg, because I'm not a political expert by any means, but it was my view to Senator Hertzberg and to the sponsor of the bill that SB 930 will have accomplished an awful lot if you simply get the conversation started. Anything you can do to get the conversation started, and even if it's grunting and sweating, to make that ball move forward just a couple of inches is probably a good fight to have. So yes, I think you can expect to see it back. Thank you.